Hey, LinkedIn, and welcome back to Business Unusual. This is a live show where we're talking with you as a community about how the coronavirus is impacting the ways that we all work. I'm your host, Caroline Fairchild, editor-at-large at LinkedIn, coming to you from my office here in New York City. While the impact of the coronavirus has been devastating for millions of Americans, there are a lot of people who right now have an overwhelming desire to help, whether it's making masks for neighbors or getting food for essential workers. We've seen thousands of you share on and off LinkedIn, your acts of kindness that you're doing right now during this massive time of uncertainty. On today's show, we'll talk to a CEO who's trying to make sure that those acts of kindness happen at scale. Kind CEO Daniel Bitsky is joining us on today's show to talk about his new Frontline Impact Project, where he's connecting essential workers who need goods and services to businesses who can provide them. We'll talk to him about that, as well as how he's navigating his 16-year-old food company during this crisis. I first interviewed Daniel about six years ago, and we talked about why virtual Actually, kind bars seem to be everywhere during this crisis. How has the distribution strategy changed? How is the supply chain? We'll talk through those. And then Daniel really, as a guest shark on Shark Tank, he has a lot of advice for entrepreneurs. So if you're in the stream right now and want to have questions about your business, let us know. I'm sure Daniel would love to have a conversation with you about that on today's show. But before I bring on Daniel, I really do want to hear from you. The whole point of this show is to come together as a community and talk about how the coronavirus is impacting the ways that we all work. So say hello to us in the stream. Let us know what's happening in your community with your business. And Daniel and I will bring you on to the show as well as we have a conversation about all of this. So with that, I want to bring on Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Hi, how are you? Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. First, I just want to start off with where are you and how are you doing right now? Um, I am well. My family is well. We're very blessed. My wife is a doctor. Uh, most of us are for telemedicine. Once in a while, having to see her patients. She's a transplant nephrologist, which is not a necrologist. When I first met her, I was scared I was going to marry someone that deals with dead bodies. But no, she's a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor. But nephrology patients are very uh, vulnerable to this disease. So she sees them mostly through telemedicine, but once in a while she's um, visiting with them in person. And I wanted to take, I wanted to go back with you to the beginning of this crisis. What was the moment when you kind of knew that this coronavirus was going to have a huge impact on kind and a huge impact on your focus for 2020? Well, every day kind of changes, and there's. I think the the greatest problem is that this disease brings so much not just fear but also so much uncertainty. There's so much we don't know, and we're in an age where disruption was already a theme for our lives, and that's probably going to just accentuate. And I find that the this pandemics accentuate everything, accentuate the good and the bad, and they accentuate the trends also. And one of those trends is just more and more disruption. I, in my industry, we were about to have a trade show uh, the first week of March, and the trade organization kept insisting that we're going to hold the show, even though a lot of the large companies and pretty much all retailers had canceled. And I wrote an article actually on LinkedIn uh, that got a lot of um, attention, and it was a little bit of a contributor, a catalyst to forcing the trade organization to suspend the show. We were going to have 85,000 people from all across the world gathering in a close space to try each other's foods and hand each other food for four days or three days. Um, I'm pretty certain that it would have become, you know, poster child number one for uh, the ex ex extreme spread of the disease. So in retrospect, it was very good that we... Uh, pressed for us to sadly delay this because it's very hard for small entrepreneurs that are just getting uh, off the ground not to be able to participate in these trade shows where they get found. Right. And, you know, this is actually the third time that we've sat down. This one's virtual, but, you know, we've actually, I've interviewed on stage at a live event. I've interviewed you several times in person. And throughout all those conversations, you've talked about how important your employees are. Throughout this crisis, how have you been communicating with them in terms of what this means for them coming to work safely, uh, what this means for the safety of their jobs? How have you been thinking about that as the leader of the company? First of all, we don't even think of them as employees. We think of all of our, we never use that word. We say team members because sadly the word employee connotes or this like hierarchy uh, and we're all just 
owners, everybody uh, of kind, every full-time team member has stock in the company and our culture, not just our financial stakes are intertwined and people think of each other. I think in this environment, it really helps that people act like owners. We really have not missed the beat as far as I can tell in terms of moving to work from home. And it almost surprises me. And I knock around different departments and team members. I'm like, really? Everything seems to be going okay. It is harder on our supply chain team. They're incredible. I'm very fortunate that about a year and a half ago or a year ago, I appointed Mike Barkley as our CEO. I'm now executive chairman. And then Mike brought in an incredible addition of talent. We already had a really, really great team. But he brought, for example, our COO Dan Poland, who's basically, if he wasn't here today, I don't know that we would have been able to weather the storm relatively as well as we have on the supply chain front. Because if you have one single team member get sick in any factory, you need to close the entire factory, do very, very thorough cleans, and then very slowly bring them back on. The disruption happening is incredible in terms of channel shifting, going from, you know, a lot of impulse purchases in convenience stores and travel channels and airlines to a lot more plant purchases on online and mass and grocery. The patterns of consumption are changing. Our breakfast portfolio is growing really, really much faster than historically because people are staying at home and actually having breakfast items. And week to week, it changes so much. Like March, we grew a lot because even beat our forecast because people were hoarding. Then April, we actually gave much of that back because people were staying home. And I think as people adapt to this new new, it's going to hopefully slightly normalize, but it's still very, there's a lot of uncertainty. It's very hard for the supply chain team to have the right amount of products and the right inventory at the right points for the right stores because each of those items are packed differently. Those of you who are just joining the stream, I'm here with Daniel Lubitsky. He is the founder and the executive chairman of Kind. I referred to him as the CEO at the top of the show because I think he was CEO the last time that we chat. So apologies about that. But we were talking about Kind's business and we want to talk with you. So I want to say hello to John from Scotland, Cheryl from Oklahoma, Edwin from the Netherlands, Regina from Florida. Thank you for joining us. Emma says thank you to all the essential workers and heroes who are joining us on today's show as well. I want to echo Emma's sentiment. Daniel, let's talk a little bit about how, you know, as the executive chairman and founder of Kind, you have some time now to do some other projects. I want to hear more about the Frontline Impact Project. What exactly is that and how did that come together? So it came together because we wanted to find a small way to contribute to the frontline heroes that every day are risking their lives to keep us safe. So it's first responders, it's healthcare workers, nurses, people, uh, you know, elderly facilities, people at, uh, you know, uh, I forgot the name of the places where people pass away and their hospices. And um, we didn't have enough of a distribution network to reach. We wanted to donate 5 million kind bars and we could partner with the top hospitals, which we did quite efficiently. But when we wanted to reach that hospice in that rural neighborhood, who are probably the people that need it most because they're the ones that are getting the least attention, we didn't have that network. And we partnered with a project N95, which had a group of volunteer technologies that created a platform of over 3,000 qualified recipients. And they are focused primarily on PPE, personal protective equipment and trying to qualify vendors and help facilitate those connections to the, those institutions that need them. But then we partner with them to have a flow of information also for all the corporate donors like kind. And since we founded this, I think only like three plus weeks ago, we already have over 40 partners, including small, medium and large enterprises uh, from Justin Spinner Butter to Hint Water to Saffron Road Meals. And we are able to more efficiently match corporate donors that want to find a way to support those on the front line with the front line uh, leaders that need that help but are very busy to organize themselves. So we provide all the information flow and we just make it much more streamlined and efficient to reach up to 3,000 uh, qualified recipients without 
burdening them. One of the more interesting parts of the project for me was that it's not just big and big companies that you're working with, but also smaller partners as well. We've heard a lot about what big companies are doing right now. What are some examples of the smaller companies? I'm sure that there are a lot of people in the stream who say own a small a small business and want to know how they can help. What are some examples of ways you're partnering on that smaller end to get essential workers the goods and services that they need? Yeah, no, we're tapping a reservoir of goodwill that is immense because we're all so grateful for those people that are risking their lives every day and we want to give back. So it's not just food products, it's also skincare products. There's a company called Image Skincare that provides face, you know, people that are wearing face masks 10, 12 hours a day, they develop really uh, impact on their skins and to be able to soothe their skins. So there's skincare companies that are joining us, people with mental health healthcare facilities. Uh, I have a team member, Erica Blispatny, who used to work at Kind and then went on to start her own company called Rowdy, which is doing uh, uh, <laughs> exercise by, by, by uh, dancing. Hopefully don't assume this is the way they do it. And uh, they provided free membership to, um, to the healthcare community. There's a lot of service providers and product providers, food, skincare, that just want to find a small way to contribute and finding different ways to connect with them. That's so great to hear. And Daniel, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about empathy. We've chatted several times over the past six years, and there's a lot of doom and gloom out there. But what are you? How do you feel like this crisis is bringing us together in terms of we're all experiencing this? And what are you seeing on the ground in terms of people wanting to interact with things like the Frontline Project and also just help each other right now? Well, I, I first don't want to minimize both the impact in lives and livelihoods. It's very serious. It's nothing that I've experienced in my lifetime before. Uh, and and I, I, at the same time, I think we're very lucky that it's not what my father experienced because my father was in the Holocaust. He was in a concentration camp. So relatively speaking, our, our world is much better positioned to to weather this. But, it, but it's it's a very serious issue. And I do think it's... Uh, going to have reverberations that are going to be very serious and people that are, you know, losing a loved one or people that are not able to put food on their table or their dream has been uh, extended and, 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 and challenged. It's very serious. But yes, there are silver linings. We're able to spend more time with our loved ones, uh, improve the environment. And I do think we need to, we have a responsibility to not waste this crisis and to try to find ways so that when we reopen and not just into the next six months or year or two years, but into what the rest of our lifetimes, find what is it that we can do better from this crisis. And there's a lot, you know, we can develop much smarter ways to work. Like it's shocking to me that we've been relatively so effective amidst this crisis. And Every CEO that I've talked to at companies all over the spectrum seems to have the same experience that work from home has not been uh, as difficult as we assumed. You know, at Kind, we have a culture where we love being with each other. We love our team. We love seeing each other's faces. And that is still very hard not to have. But, you know, when we go on uh, Microsoft Teams and see our, our colleagues and their faces, it's a little heartwarming. It's not the same as being able to have the camaraderie and the creativity of coming up with ideas in the hallways. And I don't think you will ever replace that. But I think work from home is here to stay. I think we will uh, make it much more acceptable at our company than it used to be. Yeah, well, that's definitely been a theme that we've been exploring on this season of Business Unusual. And if you are just joining us, this is Business Unusual. We're having a conversation with Daniel Lubitsky, the founder and executive chairman of Kind, about how he's supporting essential workers at this time, what's going on with Kind's business. And he's also a guest shark on Shark Tank. I'm seeing some entrepreneurs in the stream right now already asking questions. So if this is some free business advice from Daniel Lubitsky right now. So if you want to have, have some questions for him, let us know in the stream. I'm actually going to take a question right now that I just saw from Karen. She got to know, Daniel, what leadership qualities have you drawn on to successfully navigate through this pandemic and food security crisis? I mean, I think what you mentioned, Carolyn, empathy is so important for us to teach our children, for us to teach each other, for us to develop ourselves uh, and try to not judge so much. I think critical listening is really absent in our society today and very important. 
We cannot politicize this thing. There is no perfect black or white answer. It's not lives or livelihoods. They're very intertwined. And, you know, how we open, when we open, we cannot allow political agendas to get in the way of doing things that are the right way to do them with the right advice, with the right thinking, with the right data to really balance between the very, very important need for people to provide livelihoods and the very important need to, to protect lives. And uh, so besides critical thinking and empathy, I would say resourcefulness, nimbleness is extraordinarily important and it's gonna be more and more important into the future. You need to be creative, you need to think outside the box. You need to be a critical thinker about what has changed and how can you move very nimbly to try to take advantage of those changes. The obvious one is everything is moving online. How can I pivot my products and services to make sure that I take advantage of those online opportunities? It's a time for deep introspection. Uh, it's very, very important for you to think critically about what you got, what you don't have. Maybe if you find a silver lining, you have gained a month or two to perfect your product or service, to test it before you go out and, and, and try to create a better mousetrap before you start promoting it. I think the most important thing is Playbooks have never been the right way for you to grow your business, less so in a pandemic where whatever worked for kind five years ago, if you tried to replicate it, would have never been the right way because things evolve, things change. And if when I was growing kind, the right way was for me to sample one product at a time in the specialty markets. Now you might want to sample in mass or through online. But now with the pandemic, for sure you have to throw out all those old playbooks. It's very important to rely on toolkits rather than playbooks. So the playbook is, how did somebody else do this? Throw that away, don't even think. Think more critically about how does it apply to me, but do try to preserve those values and mindsets of grit, of purpose, of perseverance, of critical and creative thinking. You mentioned that it's not black and white and there's this pandemic is making it so that business owners are having to navigate through uncertainty almost on a day to day basis. I imagine that a lot of those business owners are reaching out to you with questions, particularly in the food space. I'm curious what the biggest challenges are that the other business owners are coming to you with and how you're helping them navigate each question as they're coming in. And also, is everything's changing every day? I think there's two that come to my mind. Number one, innovation, which is something that all of us love and enjoy, right? That's one of my favorite aspects of Kind in coming up with new products. We have here a Kind Energy Bar that we're just launching. And uh, sorry for the other, yeah, just apropos, I was eating one. And uh, how do you let people try and experience those products? Normally, Kind, we're known for giving millions of products for people to experience because we think that when people try them, then word of mouth is gonna help us grow. And we just launched a line called Kind Frozen, which are like ice cream bars but made with a creamy almond base. We need to get people to try them, but now we can't give them out those bars for free or cut them up because people don't wanna talk about it. So innovation is very tricky, both in terms of getting into the retailers because retailers are like just trying to keep up. And so they're deferring the innovation planograms by weeks. And I don't think innovation is gonna die, but it's probably gonna just slow down because people are just trying to hang for their lives. I think that's one big one. The biggest one, of course, is supply chain continuity. And that's where the big guys are very well positioned because they've developed that. And the smaller companies that don't have resilient or um, dual systems or they have backups can really get in trouble. Because like I said earlier, if you only have one factory where you're making your products and one team member gets sick, you have the responsibility to do a very thorough cleaning and to check that nobody else is going to get sick. So you might need to close down the facility for several days. And if that's your sole source of supply, it can cause enormous harm to you. So we are going to be all in our industry more responsible for creating uh, backup plans so that we can be more resilient uh, with these disruptions. 
Right. I've seen a comment here in the stream from Jenny who says it's commendable that the entire factory is shutting down for sanitation. Even only one person is infected. I think moving forward, public or private facilities have already or in the process of upgrading washing stations with touch free faucets. Jenny, thanks for joining us. John has a question here and it's going to require you to take out your crystal ball a little bit, Daniel, but he wants to know how will this disruption that you mentioned impact kind long term? Well, hopefully it will make us more resilient because whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I really do believe that, uh, you know, we are going to be probably more nimble. I don't think we're going to need as big an office in New York, you know, come 2000 when, when our lease expires. I think we're probably going to preserve that a, a very strong presence in New York, but we probably are going to allow more people to work from home. Uh, I think we need to question every single thing. We need to take advantage of this. Take advantage is not the right word, but we need to seize uh, this crisis as an opportunity to rethink what can we do better? What have we found out that by doing things working digitally, like we can travel less. So a lot of the meetings we do like and we intend to continue going to meet our retailers in person because nothing can replace that and develop that bond and go deep. But I'm finding that a lot of my team members are saying I'm being more productive. I don't have that two hour commuting to the office every single day back and forth. Some of my team members have four hours of commute and it's inefficient, it's costly, it's bad for the environment. People that are traveling, crisscrossing the country to meet our customers every single time. We're probably going to re realize that some of that can be done through virtual meetings and uh, through online interaction. Um, I could keep going, but I don't want to bore you too much. No, I think that that's great. And I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of entrepreneurs in the stream right now with questions around how you're kind of navigating the business. I know that you are a guest shark on Shark Tank, which uh, you have an episode coming out. It's the last episode this week that you're on. This Friday is the season finale, and I, I'm on it, and uh, I think it's a good one. I was telling Daniel before the show started that if you gave me a list, ask me to make a list of 100 CEOs who are going to go on Shark Tank, Daniel would not be on it. So I'm interested, what prompted you to go on Shark Tank? What are you learning through the process? And for those who are on the stream who have their own businesses, anything that they can take away from your experience on the show? Well, first of all, my, my family enjoys Shark Tank a lot. When I watch it with my kids, I use it as an opportunity to ask them questions about, okay, the company says that they want $100,000 for 10%. Use your math, how much is the company worth? So I try to uh, to use the opportunity of Shark Tank to keep my kids engaged and entertained, but also informed and educated. So I enjoy it and our family enjoys it. I've always found it an interesting platform for sharing business insights with people. I think you it's tricky, right? Because you have four segments in, in a short time. But when you're able to provide input and perspective, it's, I think, very valuable. And I think it's a beautiful way to provide entrepreneurship lessons and, and create an entrepreneurship culture or some deepen the entrepreneurship culture in our country. For me personally, what I get out of it is I, it's, it's very intellectually stimulating. It's very challenging because you don't get any uh, information ahead of time. You see the entrepreneur literally... When the way the audience is it, that's how we're seeing it like for the first time. And you have to very quickly discern patterns and try to detect things in the subtext to decide whether you want to do a deal or not. And then you have four sharks that are real sharks and you have to try to get the deals that you want and not lose them. I lost two deals uh, to Mr. Wonderful who came in from out of nowhere and, and I'm determined to not let that happen in the future. But um, and then you have to do it with your own tone and be authentic and try to give earnest feedback. Well, hopefully my approach is to, to not be a jerk and not be tough, but to be authentic and real and kind is a lot of people associated with softness, niceness. But being kind is very different from being nice. You can be nice and be polite and just not say things. But to be kind, you have to be honest and authentic. So you have to find a way to say what needs to be said and help person is like the person that has a something on their tooth you if you're kind you say that to them even though it might be uncomfortable if you're nice you just was that a sign it. was that was that, that, was no, that? No, you're fine. Okay, good. um i have a question in the stream here from steven he wants to know what do you think entrepreneurs miss when they're pitching their company on shark tank 
Um, I think authenticity is in real life and in the Shark Tank the most important thing. And I think if you have, uh, if you don't have the perfect team, you should try to get the the right team. And if you have certain things missing from your skill sets, try to complement yourself with that person before coming into a tank. But if you don't have the resources to do that, then acknowledge very concretely, this is what I need. And I think an entrepreneur that's sufficiently introspective to understand what they don't have, in my eyes, has more chances to win than the entrepreneur that doesn't realize what they don't have. We see a lot of talent uh, in Shark Tank, a lot of entrepreneurs, so inspiring, so creative. And then you also see a lot of great products, but then sometimes you see a great product by an entrepreneur that has a lot of misses, or a great entrepreneur, but the product really doesn't fit the needs. You need both. Both, I think, on the on the stream right now. So I want to go back to the frontline worker project and ask you for the business owners on the stream right now who want to get involved or you know feel like they want to help. What is, what would you say to them? And then on the other side of that, we have a lot of essential workers who are joining us right now. What is your advice to them in terms of if they're feeling lost or ha finding a hard time right now just going into the office? So the first thing is anybody that works as a first responder, whether they're a uh, fireman or woman, or they are working in the National Guard, or they're a healthcare worker in the hospital, in a hospice, in an elderly care facility, please go to frontlineimpact.org, frontlineimpact.org, and register, and we want to be able to match you and support you. And if you're a corporate donor that wants to provide your products or services to those healthcare workers or first responders, responders, please also register, and then our team will get in touch with you and try to onboard you so that you can help, and so we can very efficiently help you help uh, our, our frontline heroes. Uh, for essential team members and for everybody, first, thank you. I mean, the, I'm not, my wife is uh, more remarkably actually meeting patients and even she makes sure that she says, no, no, I'm not one of those here because she's not going there every day dealing with COVID patients. But people that are in the grocery stores, people that are providing us those services every single day, Thank you so much because it's not lost on us that, that you're there to help all of us function as a society. And I think all of us need to keep perspective and, and, and take all the precautions, but also not allow this thing to eat up our minds. Uh, my mom just shared a, an email that was really well drafted about talking about how this thing is as dangerous to the mind and the soul as it is to our hearts because we cannot allow the fear to have a disproportionate impact than the virus already is going to have on us. So we need to find a way to temper this and to try to keep proper perspective. I think that is a beautiful note to end on, Daniel. I always enjoy sitting down with you, whether it's virtual or not. I know I speak from the stream when I say I think we learned a lot on today's show. Nilda says, I appreciate your company's mission and products. Thank you for your commitment to quality stacks. Thank you for spending time with us on this Monday, Daniel. I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks to everybody. Stay safe. That was Daniel Lubitsky. He is the founder and executive chairman of Kind, walking us through how he's navigating Kind's business, how he's supporting essential workers right now, and what you in the stream can do to do the same. I'm Caroline Fairchild. This is Business Unusual, a daily live show where we're talking with you about how the coronavirus is impacting the ways that we work. I'll be back with you tomorrow at noon, talking to business owners about how they're navigating hospitality, leisure, what they're doing with their jobs, how they're thinking about reopening potentially. So please let us know if you have questions about that in this stream and join us back here on the LinkedIn editors page tomorrow at noon. I'll see you then.